I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and sex shop owner. And I'm April, VP of an international high-end pleasure products company and boss queen sex toy mogul. We're best friends who make our own rules about who we are as sexual beings. With everything from how to be a badass in the bedroom to top tips for bringing your relationship to the next level, we have something just for you. So sit back, relax, and and enjoy enjoy the show. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Hello, everyone. Hey, everybody. This is your bonus episode. We do our regular See You Next Tuesday episode every Tuesday, but once a month we're giving you a bonus episode ad-free because some of you complain you don't like the ads, but guess what? This is free for you, and sometimes we need ads (laughs) so that we can eat and buy wine and buy new microphones and things like that. So here you go. Here's an ad-free one, so we're not going to talk a lot. Are you ready for a bio? I yes, uh, Susanna Wise, right? Susanna Wise. So Susanna Wise is a freelance sex and relationships writer who currently serves as a regular contributor to Vice, Teen Vogue, Bustle, Glamour, Playboy, New York Magazine, and more. She frequently discusses gender, body image, and social justice on radio shows and podcasts, and has spoken at conferences, including South by Southwest. To learn more, visit SusannaWeiss.com. That's S U Z A N N A H. W E I S S dot com. Ready? Let's close the orgasm gap. Let's do it. All right, everyone, it's episode time. This is one of our bonus episodes that we love offering you ad free just for you, but packed full of information. This one is called The Orgasm Gap or On the Orgasm Gap, rather, with Susanna Weiss. We already read the bio for Susanna. So let's just dive right in. Welcome to the podcast, Susanna. We're happy to have you here. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Where are you in? Are you in New York? Is that where you are? I am. Okay. Um, I'm a digital nomad, but I'm in New York right now. Ooh, digital nomad. Ooh. Sounds mysterious. Hey, you travel all over the world, right? hmm That's mm-hmm. great. What was your last trip? Where did you go? Miami, but that was for a bachelorette party. I was just in Miami, too. You guys could have party. Oh, really? Maybe I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> Miami. All right, so let's talk about this orgasm gap. People are probably wondering, what the hell is an orgasm gap? What is the orgasm gap? The orgasm gap is the tendency for men to orgasm more frequently than women. Um, It's reported in many countries um, and particularly during partnered sex and during hookup sex Um, and for straight men and women. It doesn't happen as much um, for lesbians versus gay men. But for straight men versus women, one study found, for example, that um, 65% of straight women said that they orgasmed every or almost every time over the past month versus 95% of straight men. Mm-hmm. And the um, lesbians said about 86%, I believe, and gay men said 89%. So it was mostly a heterosexual phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And so it's the so it's the gap between so we're talking about straight folks. It's the gap between um, the vulva owners are having a lot less orgasms than the penis owners. Is that that's what you're saying? Yes. Well, specifically, those studies were on cis men and women. I'm not sure if you included vulva owners who don't identify as women. I'm not sure how it would come out, but okay. uh-huh. I think it's more about women versus men because it's more societal. I think. And this is more common in hookup sex. We live in this hookup culture. I think the statistics say that some of the worst sex that people have is when they're in college, if you go to college, um, which is like hookup central. People don't know what the hell they're doing. Drunken, (laughs) sloppy, and at least my experience with hookup (laughs) sex in college. And then you wake up and you're like, I don't remember your name or where my pants are. (laughs) And a lot of these studies are often done with 
college students because that's where you can actually get the information from. So I, I mean, I, I bet it speaks to beyond college students, but I would imagine that it really is speaking to that, to the hookup culture of college students. So why does this exist? Why is this even a thing? There are a lot of reasons it's a thing, but they all seem to come down to the devaluing of women's pleasure. One reason it's a thing is that the way we define sex is heterosexual penis and vagina intercourse, which only one quarter of cis women say they always orgasm from. Mm -hmm. So we're already um, setting up sexual scripts that are geared toward male orgasm. Usually there's also an oral sex gap in which, um, and again, especially in college students and hookups, um, and report receiving much more oral sex. There's also been studies showing that when women receive oral sex, it's more often in order to warm them up for intercourse Mm -hmm. than to make them orgasm. Um, so it's still ultimately for the goal of male orgasm, um, So we've defined sex and set up sex in such a way that um, women are at a disadvantage unless they want to, unless they ask for something, quote unquote, extra, like oral or manual sex, which shouldn't be extra. Um, In other words, clitoral stimulation. Um, Another reason I think we have this definition of sex, part of it is just a devaluing of female pleasure, but it's also, um, it has to do with heteronormativity that we define sex as penis and vagina. It comes back to Freud saying um, part of a woman's maturity is developing a vaginal orgasm because the assumption was that she needed to be ready to have sex involving a penis. Of that course, was the the clitor- he said the clitoral orgasm was the inferior orgasm or something, right? Wasn't that his his jam? There was a hierarchy of yeah. orgasm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he said inferior. I think he said immature. Oh gosh, oh, gosh. that's even worse. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and then the I mean, uh, what kind of orgasm uh, is? The preferred orgasm for me is clitoral. However, I did once have a cervical cervical orgasm and now it is my lifelong goal to continue to have those because it was so intense and so amazing. So I did create a hierarchy in my own brain with orgasm because I'd never achieved anything that in my opinion, that blissful. And my whole body was like jarring. Mm -hmm. And it was right after we recorded a podcast about, uh, with Willow Brown Mm. and she had mentioned the clitoral orgasm or the, um, cervical cervical orgasm. Anyway, I think maybe I just planted that seed, but there is no hierarchy of orgasm for anyone, even Freud. Right. I wonder how, what Freud did for orgasms for folks. (laughs) I want to know that. Do you think he was gray in bed? Do you think so? No, I highly <laughs> doubt. Let's ask him. Let's see if we can do some research on that. Well, and then and then there's also the part of porn is where people are still learning most of their sex education. Porn is all about what the cock likes, unless you find some awesome feminist porn. But it's very penis centric. The cock likes a lot of deep, heavy thrusting, really quick in and out, and it misses all like most of the clitoral structure with all the movements. Um, and that's where people are learning how to have sex. So I would imagine that that's like a huge contributor to this gap. Although, I, and then they will go back to the Victorian era too, where which was like, are you talking about the oral sex piece? Oral sex wasn't even a thing for in the Victorian era. It was, I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't a thing that, thing, yeah, closet. it was a thing that people that loved each other, they didn't do it together. You know, you it's go, still oh, illegal. Oh. Oral sex is still illegal in Wisconsin where I grew up. Really? <laughs> Uh, well, specifically fellatio. Because it's under the category of sodomy. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I'm going to go suck some dick in Wisconsin. I did. I suck dick in Wisconsin. <laughs> oh, you're going to jail. It's going to jail. Yeah. So, okay. And so what do people do? So people probably don't believe this, right? People probably think, ah, this, this must not be a real thing. And what, so what are some of the myths around this? Like, what, you know, there's, there's just the reasons why, obviously the reason why you're, you're, the reasons why it exists are more uh, socially constructed ideas around what sexuality should be and everyone's buying into it. And the, and our, also one thing I want to say, the caretaking thing here that is going on for centuries upon centuries as a survival mechanism for, uh, I think, uh, 
I don't know if it's cis women, but I, I think that women are dealing with it more. Um, and so then there, so there's this thing and there's this book, Girls and Sex. Have you heard of that book? No. It's written about, it's for adults to read about their, their young girls to scare the shit out of them about <laughs> the studies are showing that younger, young girls, you know, age 12 or 13, they're not starting to actually have penetrative sex at a younger age. I think it's actually, um, they're wait, they're waiting. It's actually later than it used to be, especially back in the day, but they're giving blowjobs at a much younger age because it's a part of getting attention and affection and being like cool. And so yeah. that's starting at a younger age, but they're not receiving oral sex. They're giving and at a much younger age than they ever really have been. And so that's an interesting thing there too. But anyway, it's my tangent. So what about the myths around this orgasm gap? The primary myth is that it's biological. I think a lot of people believe that female orgasms are more elusive. um, And that often becomes self-perpetuating because then it feels like if you, if a woman doesn't orgasm, then that's just because female orgasm is elusive. And um, there's almost no point in trying after a certain point. However, um, studies show that when women receive oral and manual sex, um, 90% or more orgasm, um, And also women take on average about four minutes to orgasm through masturbation. So, um, and while there are about five to 10% of women who say they've never had an orgasm, um, most do learn within a few weeks of practice. Mm. So it's really more of a cultural thing than a biological thing. And it's certainly not an inevitable thing. We had, so we recorded a podcast yesterday with Melissa Fritchley on uh, depression, sex, SSRIs, et cetera. But she spent a lot of time, it was Ghana? Yes. Ghana. Yes. And in Ghana, the norm in, in the country of Ghana is that all the women know how to have ejaculatory orgasms. Why did she say that was? Uh, I don't, I guess it's something that they've just adapted. Their bodies have adapted or, or it's they're like, taught. But it's praised too. And it's praised. And, and they it's call not it, shamed. And they, it's not shamed. And they call it spraying the wall. Yes. And in fact, sex workers in Ghana will get paid more. by men, paid more to actually have a, an, a, an ejaculatory orgasm. So yeah, so there's this, it's, it is cultural, right? There's some places where I think it was Wednesday Martin or someone else said that part of the culture, I forgot where it is, is in South Africa, or sorry, Africa or uh, South America, the, the, as a rites of passage, the men had to learn how to give women orgasms as a right, rites of passage. And I was like, we need to, let's bring that shit here, come in. That would be, that would be pretty awesome. So, I read about that. I think they take like an older lover, like an older yeah. woman who teaches them the ropes and then they can go off and have lovers their own age. Yeah, that would be well, awesome. There's, I mean, culturally in Ethiopia, um, when you're, I think, six or seven years old, you you are also offered to um, older men that they can- Six or seven. Six or seven years old. I've read this whole study. There's, oh Well, my, they still practice some genital mutilation too. Um, I think it's specific, specific to North African region speaking? of Ethiopia. And there's another region too, right below that. When you say they're offered, are they offered for the man's pleasure though? Or are they being offered for they them? Get, the family gets, um, I think, a dowry of some sort. Right, so this and is, this so isn't young so women, women learn to have orgasms. No. <laughs> this is all, but I'm just saying culturally Cultural, it's acceptable. Yeah. So yeah. it's not, and it's specific to little children, six-year-old girls yeah. specifically. And I like highlighting these things. Of course, I don't love the fact that six and seven-year-old girls are being given away for a dowry, but I, but I do like highlighting the fact that everything is based on context, on, it's based on time, place, the culture, you know, what we think here right now in the United States is the norm for sex was different 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And yet we get stuck thinking that the, because it's what's, we think is true now, it must be the truth everywhere all the time and has, always has been. Same applies for monogamy, orgasms, whatever that is. Um, so I, I like highlighting that, the difference between, um, between cultures. So how do we solve, I mean, I know we're going to call it a problem. How do we solve this problem of the orgasm gap? Challenge. Challenge. Yeah. Well, obviously we need better sex education, um, which acknowledges the clitoris and acknowledges female pleasure. However, we don't, and that probably will be the case for a while. So I think um, 
sites like, um, oh my God, yes, and O School and Scarletine that are teaching people sex ed are very important. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, oh my God, yes, it's a site where like you can see demonstrations, uh, women like demonstrating kinds of touch that they like, and then you could practice on a virtual vulva. O School is a site with like various talks on sex ed for adults. Um, Scarletine is more of an advice site for teens, like with like an advice column. Um, there's also a site called Ask Alice that's like that. But I guess we just need, while people can still watch porn, to not rely on that for sex education, or at least for their entire sex education. Even like the sex subreddit, I find a lot of good information there. Like that people just be more proactive in seeking out information. Um, and that I don't want to put it all on women, but um, part of it, because hopefully you shouldn't need to explain that, like, um, for example, penetration may not do everything for you. But, you know, if you personally want to advocate to have more orgasms, um, you could bring a toy into the bedroom. You could tell your partner that um, only one in four women orgasm through intercourse or just have a talk and ask them what they like and say what you like, which should be happening anyway. Um, and if you're the par a woman's partner, um, you could, well, ask her what she likes, obviously, and also not make her orgasm about your ego because then that makes makes it harder to orgasm if you're feeling all that pressure um but just let her know that you care about her pleasure and um don't center your penis if if you have a penis like understand that it may not be the center of her sex life mm -hmm. um i like that <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's also so difficult sometimes to just explain to folks what you like when you're in the bedroom especially when you're in that situation where it's hot and heavy you're turned on and it's like what do you like i'm always basically uh, a deer in headlights would be the best way to describe that. I'm like, I don't know. What should we try? Let's try something. So being experiential and kind of open when you are, if you were the long-term partner or new partners, kind of saying, I'm not sure, but I'd love to explore mm -hmm. is always a great way. Or doing it before you get to the bedroom portion where the pressure's obviously a little bit higher. Maybe doing it beforehand, like a negotiation, mm -hmm. like a friendly business meeting. April loves business meetings. She likes turning everything into a, a deal. <laughs> Closing deals. Yeah, I go this far, you go this far, you can't meet me. Deal off. Deal off the table. Nipples for the first five minutes, there's going to be a timer that goes off after which you start petting my clitoris. Yes. <laughs> and so some fun facts about that. I, um, so I did a, a certification to be a sex educator in 2008. They, they were not showing in, in, in any of the textbooks there. And also I went to school for psychology and human sexuality. Um, before that, there was no textbook showing the full clitoral structure. Um, apparently they did know that it, it was a wishbone. There was more to it than just the little nub, but they still didn't have it in textbooks. They were not teaching that. And it wasn't, I think Wednesday Martin says it wasn't until 2010 that it was widely publicized. Oh, wait, there's a lot more going on, everyone. And it has around 8,000 nerve endings and it's the powerhouse of pleasure. It's the only body part designed for pleasure. It's like an internal shaft. Yes. Yeah. It's, there's, a, there's a lot going on there. Uh, and, and so I'm curious because I don't know now. I know that they're not talking about pleasure in, you know, for young people in middle school and high school. Anatomy. Yeah, I wonder if that's included in anatomy. Now, maybe they're not saying like, hey, it's the powerhouse of pleasure. Go help, go wank yourself, <laughs> go wank your clitoris. But I wonder if they're actually showing that. Into, I'd be curious to see what the textbooks are showing now. Uh, I also did co-teach. sit in a seventh grade class. Let's do it. <laughs> It'd be so entertaining. I think this is so cool. And then I'd be like, can I speak for a little bit about orgasms, please? And, and I also, I did co-teach a workshop with someone that was sex ed for middle schoolers while we couldn't go into the public school system, parents could privately pay for their kids to come and learn with us. And, and it was for the parents to come as well. Uh, and it was very affordable. It was like 20 bucks a class or something like that. And it was very interesting to see. So we, fun fact about this, this is, a, this is another gap, right? It's not, I mean, it's not an orgasm gap, but it's like um, a gender gap thing. We, we said, hey, we have this workshop. This is for parents and their middle schoolers age 11 to 13 to come. That's what we said. Only moms and their daughters came. 
<laughs> and so and and they were and they assumed that that's how it should be so this is there's this idea that the women are supposed to teach their daughters about sex and that the their husbands don't need to do that it's not their job and that the boys don't need the education because they're not going to get pregnant but yes you are <laughs> or you're going to get someone else pregnant so i thought that was just that was just another gap there in terms of the conversations there's ideas about specific roles that i think is as specific to you know our culture here that will probably be very different in other cultures but it's it's huge and it's getting in the way and then the way the country's going now with abortion becoming more uh, illegal in a lot of places and some places are uh, there are more rights around that too it's kind of going both ways um, but sex education is not improving in schools. So we are, like you said, we have a long way to go. We're not necessarily getting closer in that department. Like we're getting closer in things that like what you're doing, you know, you are someone who is a freelance writer and specializes in sex and relationships and you're publicizing it in mainstream magazines and we're doing this, you know, over the air. And so these are ways that we are helping to maybe close that gap or change things. but. I, it really needs to start with the young people when they're starting to have sex. Like otherwise they're, they're, they're cleaning up a whole bunch of stuff that they learned or did not learn in not, in the, not the best way. And um, it's, I coming from a place of my partners who I just was dropping her off at the orthodontist. Daughter, um, his, daughter. his daughter is 14 going to be 15. And I've tried to kind of elude to some talks about sex without her dad being around. And it's so weird for her. She doesn't like to talk about it at all. When I know her friends are definitely being sexually active and doing lots of stuff. And I'm not sure. And it's not just her because they get, they all get really like skittish. Mm -hmm. And so it would be to normalize it, I think is the beginning because right now it's treated as this very, Shh, don't talk about don't it. talk about it. It's this closed door thing when if it was more of a free conversation and we live in, in Santa Cruz, California, where I feel like we have a more progressive approach to a lot of things, including sex. So that's something that I would love to see more of having sex as an open conversation, starting in the household when the kids are young and it doesn't have to be a dirty three letter word. What I'm curious also what parents think, like all the parents listening to this, when you're hearing, okay, so you have a daughter and you have a son and your daughter, knowing that your son will grow up to have a lot more orgasms and awesome pleasure than your daughter will is does that inspire for me? If I obviously, because I'm a sex educator, I would be like, "Fuck yeah!" That inspired me to have more conversations with my daughter to teach her about her body and the pleasure that she too is entitled to and capable of. So I wonder what parents think about that, knowing that this information is out there. That would this inspire you? Like, I want my daughter to feel equally as valued as any partner that she's ever with, regardless of gender, and to have the most pleasure ever. Or does it inspire them? Oh no. She's my daughter. She's my little princess. I must be <laughs> never going to be sexual. My daughter's not getting having sex until she's married. Like, good luck to That's you. My 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 uh, founder of my company is like that about his daughter. She's like seven. I'm like that girl's horny. I've seen her in the bathtub touching <laughs> her bits, and I'm like, go for it, girl. You do you. I'm so, just here helping out. <laughs> yeah. So you, you so you do the Susanna Susanna. Part of your journey is like you, in the writing that you do. It's a little bit of a tangent, but I'm curious you actually go and kind of um, adventure around and it sounds like you're kind of a little bit of your own human experiment in, in the world of sexuality. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Like what, what inspired you to do what you do to, um, to be this, you're kind of like a, a researcher writer. What inspired me um, was having a sexual awakening in college that allowed me to recover from an eating disorder and it um, led me to try to figure out how those things were connected. Mm. And I discovered that I had previously been wanting to use um, food restriction to stop my body from being sexualized mm -hmm. um, because the way that women are conceived of as sexual beings is as sexual objects in our culture. I hadn't learned an alternative narrative that allows women to be sexual without being objects. And then through my own experience, I became a subject and I saw that women could be active agents in their own sex lives. And 
So my journey is to continue to do that and to um, explore different ways that women can become active subjects in their own sexuality. And often um, the ways that are offered really just objectify them more. Well, and so I have another question then. Since you, because you are in mainstream media, I mean, you're in like bias, teen vogue, bustle, glamour, playboy, all these things. Do you get any backlash from the media outlets, like from the uh, other people that work there, or that own the companies, or any of that for for what you're saying? Because you come from a feminist perspective, do you see that um, that the 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 gap is showing up there too, where they don't want to, they don't support your um, opinions or your experiences that you have when you're you're essentially trying to kind of shatter the bullshit idea of what people think sex should be that is still very penis centric. But do you get a lot of backlash for that? No, actually, um, a lot of them. I think, um, like Glamour, for example, first contacted me to write for them because they had read what I had written in Bustle and they said they were trying to go in a more feminist direction. I later learned that soon before that they had published a piece on like 10 ways to make your guy fall in love with you. And it was like, hand him a beer when he gets out of the shower and like... Growing up right now. (laughs) (laughs) So I feel like it was a reaction against that, that they had gotten backlash for not being with the times um, and wanted something that was more feminist. So yeah, Playboy is doing the same thing. They're rebranding to try to be more woman friendly. So that's um, like my editor there is a woman and she brought on a lot of writers who are feminists. Um, So yeah, sometimes, I mean, if I have a really radical pitch, it can sometimes be hard to place it, but I'm often surprised by who will take it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm really grateful that you're doing what you do, that you're getting the message out there in the mainstream world. We had, we were, we were we've been online and things like online Maxim and GQ. And um, I think we were just in GQ as the top seven podcasts to listen to that will make you better in bed for you towards men. Cool. And I was like, all right, I'm, I, funny title and I'm into it because we are a sex positive podcast. So I hope the way that we make you better in bed is through teaching you to get over your cock being the center piece of, <laughs> of all sex uh, and to yeah, question everything that you believe in and have been taught. Um, but I, yeah, I'm really grateful to see that you're doing what you do and that you're um, uh, on a, a similar path, but in a different outlet because you're a writer. Uh, is there any like a piece of information that you really want our listeners to leave with? Like if they walk away with one thing here from about the orgasm gap, is there anything that you think is the most important for them to leave with and maybe ask themselves or um, shift in their lives? Yeah, I want women who have trouble orgasming or trouble orgasming with a partner um, to know that it's not because there's something wrong with them. It's because something's wrong with society um, because you've, we've grown up in a culture that objectifies us, that um, has sexual scripts that aren't for our pleasure, that distances us from our bodies, that instills sexual shame, that where lots of women have sexual trauma, there's different obstacles for different people, but it's all because of external obstacles that have been put in front of you. So Um, The trick is not, you know, your body wants to feel pleasure. So the trick is not to like, it's not like you have to force it to do something. It's not wired to do. It's just a question of removing the external things that have been placed on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. That really fits in with the kind of the premise of everything that we like to uh, preach on our big old soapbox, our invisible soapbox over here in (laughs) radio wave world. Uh, And I I really, really uh, appreciate that. And for all you folks who are listening, um, one thing I do want to say to penis owners, we know that things are hard for you too. We're not here hating on the penis owning world. We uh, have made some statements in the past saying, fuck the patriarchy. And I do want to clarify that when we say that, we don't say uh, we hate men or fuck, fuck men. We're talking about a system here that has stemmed out of uh, the patriarchy or what what serves uh, men best, uh, affluent men best. And we're still living in it and we're living it in a lot of ways. And it's 
uh, upsetting and really limiting. And it's also limiting to penis owners too, because if you're in a heterosexual relationship and you have a penis and your old way of thinking of the way sex should be, that it's all about your, your penis or that orgasms should happen a certain way or that you don't even you know, foreplay only needs to be for two seconds because you just go right for the nipples and then you go right for the genitals and your cock's ready to go. So you're ready to go. Um, you're limiting yourself from the uh, expansiveness that you can experience with a highly orgasmic partner, a highly satisfied or pleasured partner as well. And again, I know we're really speaking to heterosexual folks here. That's what the orgasm gap really is, it, though, is we're speaking more towards between vulvas and, and penises. Uh, and so just just an eye opener. We love you, penis owners, not hating on you, hating on the system. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a good information for folks to have. And I think that we need to take charge of our own sexuality and express ourselves and folks that have a voice. You're in a lot of mainstream publications. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And hopefully our listen, listeners can check you out um, when you're in Vice or Bustle or I don't know how many Teen Vogue listeners we have, but um, your website is uh, SusannaWeiss.com, correct? Mm-hmm. And that's um, Susanna is S-U-Z-A-N-N-A-H-W-E-I-S-S, Vice in Hebrew. <laughs> because I lived in Israel, I could speak some Hebrew. Uh, so yeah, thank you for taking the time to speak to us and thank you for your mission. And Keep up um, the good work. Yeah, please. And it's been a pleasure. We thank you. We'll see you again soon, Susanna. And thanks to all our listeners out there. We're bringing you all the things you want, including a free episode. So keep tuning in every Tuesday, y'all. We'll see you next Tuesday or maybe next Friday for another bonus episode. Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.